Andre, I, I, I want to invite you to, to speak about the kind of node that we might anticipate on, on, at, at the, GO st the, the GO station in the Liberty Lands um, based on the, the, this quite extraordinary kind of, kind of analysis that you've just offered us. Um, as you spoke, I was picturing the dramatic difference between, say, the, 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 re the retail frontage and, and, and the layers of, of pedestrian access along those east-west corridors and comparing that to, the, to what you called a, a, a car sewer, <laughs> um, or let's say, let's say a, fr a frozen arterial, which is very deliberately uh, or orchestrated to prevent fu future change. The kind of nodes that might come out of of a light a right, light rail stop or or a different kind kind of kind of surface uh, uh, route seem seem to to relate very directly to the kind to the smart track planning along the site at at, at Liberty you know just just steps away from from the image that we're seeing here in the slide and and so I I wonder if uh, if if you could speak about what those layers are again i mean you spoke very quickly on on this front ab ab about how in addition to the transit you would have pedestrian oriented oriented retail larger possibilities of, of development pedestrian net networks ca ca cars mo moving to to the to the residential areas behind and it, and it was a a strong visual sense of of the set of layers that that could could feed into a, in, in into that fabric could you could you offer us a similar kind of visualization of, of the land use patterns that would be influenced by this this very potent new, new development, the, the GO station and its tie-in to, to the to the to the smart track network that we might be seeing here? Right. Oh, maybe that's not on. Is it on? Well, I yeah, I can just. It's actually easy. Can everybody hear me? Uh, oh, it is. Okay, I just wasn't. I wasn't shouting into it. After. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the big difference between Liberty, the Liberty site, and uh, Scarborough, of course, is that it's it's an old industrial area with a grid, uh, and 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 you know, as Jane Jacobs taught us, those tight grids create the most. Uh, possible walking routes, and that's really important for pedestrians. Whereas, I mean, one of the points that we're trying to make is that in Scarborough, is because of the the carefully designed modernism of the 50s and 60s, which unfortunately we're we're still building a lot of that stuff in Toronto, in the outer edges of Toronto, is um, that you don't have the same kind of pedestrian connectivity, and and clearly for. Uh, for designing transit-oriented intensification and redevelopment, getting that pedestrian network right, not just in terms of having a dense density of connections, but also in terms of it being a quality place, uh, is, is incredibly important. Uh, and then there's, there's, well, I mean, all of the, this sort of stuff, I'm sure all, all of the architecture students are learning in detail, but, you know, it's that, that fine-grained thing so that you have variety, you don't have just sort of long blank walls is incredibly important. The, the having some diversity of different sites and different land uses. Um, my, I mean, I did a lot of work on Tokyo and, and looking at the urban form and development patterns of Tokyo. And one of the extraordinary things is because land use planning is so uh, weak is the wrong word, but flexible is probably the right word in, in, in Japan. Uh, the zoning, I mean, there is zoning everywhere, but almost any use is, is allowable in almost any zone. So there's this very, uh, and not to praise, you know, pure market driven uh, approaches to planning cities, but the, uh, if for transit oriented development and incremental change, the Tokyo model is actually quite amazing because you have these dense networks of streets and any building can be converted at any moment into, into retail, into a little workshop. So you actually do have um, this very beautiful and close relationship between the numbers of people passing a given storefront or a given home and its land use. So if you've got 
enough people going by, it's a store, right? So you can actually, I did a, a mapping once uh, of, or, or a restaurant, or you know, it's, it's, a, it's a retail use, uh, without necessarily actually changing the building. Uh, so I did this mapping of the numbers of people pa uh, entering and exiting the, the, all of the different uh, tra transit stops. I mean, whether it was, it was mostly actually, it was, the, it was the rail, the commuter rail system in the suburbs. And that maps very beautifully on, onto a, almost like a straight line correlation between the total area and retail use at that any given station. It's the numbers of people that are critical. So, I mean, I actually, I mean, I'm kind of a fan of the, the smart track idea because it, it actually will accelerate, well, if it ever happens, the, the idea is to accelerate the, the development of uh, the conversion of the GO uh, commuter rail system into uh, a much more frequent all day, both ways, uh, commuter rail system, but that's electrified. Uh, and what's revolution, and that's actually Metrolink's policy now. They're going uh, through all of the different studies to figure out the phasing of that. The, you know, the first one is the Lakeshore Corridor from Oshawa to Hamilton, which the Liberty site would be on. Um, or actually, according to John Tory, the first one would be Smart Track. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to finish this up just a second here. But the point is, the, uh, I, get, you know, this, I hate people who do these really, really long answers, but yeah, the, <laughs> the point is that uh, with electrification, uh, converting from diesel trains to electric trains, you actually have a completely different mode. The diesel trains are so slow to speed up and slow down, you have to only have an express system uh, and that GO, understandably, was always reluctant to have really many stops within the city of Toronto. So effectively, what the GO system has been so far is people in Milton and Brampton and Stouffville and places that want to go to Union Station. You couldn't actually even transfer to the TTC anywhere within the city of Toronto effectively. And that's actually almost still the case. Uh, it just was going to Union Station. And actually, that's kind of useless for the city of Toronto. Uh, what it really ought to be is the uh, electric, then you can have the express system, but also local stops. You have a local train, and the Japanese do that, the Germans do that. I mean, everywhere around the world, you can have a combination of local lines and express lines. So you have the fast, long-distance travel, but you have like a subway service along the same corridor, and then you would get your stops at places like Liberty Village, and then you have to be really concerned about getting the, the walking environment at all of those stops right to, to encourage that kind of uh, activity of y using the, 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 those uh, transit systems for your everyday life. You're doing everything that way, not just going to work. Um, to sh shift, the, um, shift the discussion back to the whole idea of um, the down, the, the, the notion of how you support and nurture creativity in an uh, incredibly rap uh, rapidly growing um, and gentrifying city. Um, I keep thinking, I keep wondering um, how we're defining what it, creative is another one of these words that um, means like something different to, to everyone. And when, when Michael, you showed that slide of all the all the, you know, in the last 10 years or 20 years, all the, the um, arts and culture related institutions that have uh, been built um, and sort of, uh, I don't think you meant it, but you sort of uh, alluded to the fact that before that, there wasn't this kind of creative, it wasn't the same kind of creative city. But in my mind, it was also an incredibly creative city but our, our, the, me the, 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 um, the metrics by which we're measuring this question were different, um, or maybe we weren't even measuring it, to your point. Um, so the, one, the, the question, I guess, is how, how can we, um, how, how do we address this issue um, 
of where creativity is happening, what, what is it, where, what in, in what kind of um, institutions or non-institutions, formal or informal ways is it happening, and how does our land use policy um, support or not those kinds of things? When, when, when businesses, what we used to do in the industrial sector and what we used to do in the institutional sector and what we used to do it at home, all of these things, these lines are all totally blurring because of technology. So how do we address these changes um, as, you know, as we look at thinking about policy in the future? I can give that a try. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the city has always been an incredibly creative city. Um, and um, uh, it was, it's, it's, uh, it's only later in the, in the life of the creative city that the big institutions piggyback on the original creativity. And so that list, uh, that uh, intersection of philanthropy and, and cultural projects, that's, that's the later development of the city. Um, uh, while I was always referring to the single family home as something that's being protected, one of the things about those single family homes in the downtown of Toronto since their first construction is they were never single family homes. So it was a misnomer. They were always multi generational homes where everything took place. They were, um, they, they were, there were gardens, um, there, there were, there were horse stables. Um, um, uh, they, they, it was the, the, even the smallest home had, had many generations of family. Those multi-generational homes now in the city of Toronto um, are as often um, someone's office as they are a place to, to, to live. Um, the garage is just as often, Bradley and Marchin did all of their robotic experiments and all of the tests in a garage on Jersey Avenue in downtown Toronto. Um, so they're just as often labs, workshops, and sites of innovation as they are anything else. So there's a fine grain that is being, um, that is the, the, the cultural resource for anyone starting their career and even beyond starting their career that is a feeder out to the main streets and from those main streets out to the major cultural institutions. So maintaining the fine grain, maintaining the flexibility, maintaining the diversity of spaces, uh, that, that is, that's the real miracle of Toronto in my opinion. And that's, the, that's where the combination of city planning, reinforcing the places where density should go um, in the downtown uh, uh, tall buildings area or on the mid-rise and avenues area. By putting the density there, one protects that hotbed of creativity, which is all the spaces in between. So I, I would um, say four things that, yes, we have been a creative city for a number of years, going back to the 1960s. Yorkville, that's the best example of development pressures, gentrification. So there were people um, <clears throat> on city council when West Queen West came about and said, you know, what's the big whoop? It's just like, this is just the way uh, our city is growing and, uh, you know, let it happen. But we have to, from, from where I'm perched, I think we need to um, do the analysis uh, put policies in place for affordable and sustainable space, creative space, and that's number one in our culture plan and in our creative capital gains, which was done in, in 2011. Um, with regards to all the um, uh, lists of cultural uh, uh, infrastructure, what I call the billion dollar cultural renaissance, it's really interesting. That was um, when the economy was doing poorly and there was super build money, the province, the feds, and it was this much money from City Hall, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting. With regards to what our creative industries, um, the, from the ground up, the collaboration between OCAD U, U of T, Waterloo, ERA Architects, and the City of Toronto, they're very defined. They're, they're uh, NOC codes, um, so, so there's, there's artists, there's creative industries, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, like the, the support, supporting industries like recording studios. So I think we're getting way more buttoned down now 
than we were. Like I've been doing this for like a dozen years, and when I first started, I'd look at you know some really great work by some great consultants, but they didn't have their name on the title of the, the study. They didn't have a date on the title of the study. It's like, what? You know, like as a student, you know, you put your name, your ID number. And, and uh, so I think that uh, we've come a long, long way. And the last point I would make is um, there's still so much more to do. So um, we're at the very, very beginning of a three-year study called TO Core Planning downtown and we have such a <laughs> you know somebody that's working on that yes um, uh, we have such an opportunity it's the first time using the same boundaries of looking at our downtown it hasn't been done since the 1970s and figuring out what it is so that it's a great place to live work and play and so what is our legacy in, in that uh, uh, project because the downtown is four times, growing four times faster than uh, any other part of the Toronto or the GTA. So we've got a real opportunity. And so this is my latest in trying to shoehorn my way in there because what I would like to see from, from my perspective is take this Creative City Toronto theme and put it into planning language. And so, like King and Spadina, you know, we're, we're, there are all these great post and beam warehouses where all of these creative industries are, are located, but they're, they're, they're under such immense development pressure. And so it's, it's, it's time to put it into planning speak. I'll just have a quick comment on that, yeah. I, uh, the other thing is that I think it's important in terms of maintaining and supporting all the, the huge, the creative industry is a huge variety, is that we don't have all of our development in the core, right? Because that actually is putting so much pressure on real estate prices. If, uh, artists actually need affordable housing, whether not necessarily social housing, but it needs to be affordable. And so, uh, Making sure that some of that accessible transit-oriented places are in the inner suburbs, I think, is just equally important in terms of maintaining the overall affordability in the Toronto region, is opening up these huge areas of lower land prices for people who want to spend a lot less on their housing. So then it's actually encouraging sort of adaptability in all of the rest of the places so that we're not totally overbuilding in, the, in that downtown core area. Maybe to to catch up with the, with the question before. Um, if I recall, for example, your three presentations, Michael, you really, I mean, you, you've coined the, the term design the architectural device that actually can foster and allow exchange and communication and uh, cross pollinization. Um, Andre, you were, you, the way how you were looking at the uh, Scarborough transit system was very strategic by saying it's not the one or the other solution that then depends on the mayor that says yes or no and calls all plans back, but really to have a look at what are the different options, what are the pros and cons in relationship to land that is going to be served, the, the corridors that are actually capable of taking on these uh, transit traffics, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the idea of a strategic approach to look at these systems. And uh, Laurie, I think you were in the beginning talking about the ecosystem in Queen West and that it's a very complex system how artists were able to create art and for sure economy is one of the major factors in the moment when i have to pay three thousand dollars for my loft and can't actually afford this i'm going to move out and this causes a whole trail of industries that move out with the artists we are talking about all of these great uh, restaurants for example that are based on a small grain because they have little restaurants places that they can actually afford and within this diversity, this really small grain, uh, Toronto in the past was able to create an incredible diversity, but that is for sure endangered. In the moment when I go ahead and build by the whole block, I'm taking everything down and I'm replacing it with a huge footprint that is covering the whole first floor. Usually drug smarts or banks or Starbucks, etc., etc. So I think there is on the one hand side, Toronto lives in its golden age. We could 
call it like this. And there's a permanent discussion if the city is doing enough to foster and support this because it seems a battle. There is a liberal market that has a favor or has more favor for the development, obviously. There's not enough protection to actually support the weaker um, parties on the stage. So if we would go around the table and would ask the question out of your professional background, you would have the possibility to put one very important code or law or approach or process on the table that you think is, would be very, very beneficial for the city. What would you think would this be? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, can I say ban the Ontario Municipal Board? Well, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? You have to explain why. <laughs> well, just, it, 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 I mean, there are wins by um, residents' associations, by the city, for sure. Um, but uh, it's just such an onerous process. And they're, they're, I just, the, the Merv, Mervish and Gary um, development proved it that, you know what, collaboration is the way to go in the future, not, not this duking it out. Um, but the, the other thing I would say is, um, geez, just, it, it, uh, there was something else I was going to say. Did, did, did. I can pass that over. Okay, yeah, we'll there was give it, give it back to you in a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, mine would uh, obviously be related to transit. I, actually, I think it is true that Toronto's in a golden age now. And it really is a huge opportunity. The amount of new investment and new building that's happening in Toronto is just un unbelievable. But it's, it's also, it's, I mean, it's not going to continue forever. And I think what we ha are getting wrong is we aren't building, we're like everybody knows, we're 30 years behind in building the public transit system. So a lot of what we're building is not transit oriented development because those transit systems aren't in place. We need to build a transit system and then ensure that the places that we're encouraging that intensification and, and redevelopment is within walking distance of that transit system. Otherwise, I mean, there's been a lot of analysis over the last 10 years, 15 years, much of the new employment development is on the highways, is on the 400 series highways. Those are, are, are job locations that are always going to be car oriented. So we actually need to get those transit systems in place and build around those if we actually want to have a more transit oriented, less car dependent city. And I think the crucial play piece is in the inner suburbs. Uh, the downtown, as, as Michael was saying, I mean, you've got all of those people walking to work. It's unbelievable. Nobody would have said that that was possible 20 years ago. So we're, we're building transit oriented stuff just in the core. That needs to spread out to the, to the inner suburbs as well. Uh, let's, well, I can, I can start with just one example that I think everyone should go and take a look and study, and it's the recent uh, office building done on the corner of Richmond and uh, Peter Street. And it's an office building that brings together a, uh, a first class, class A office building uh, that is literally floating above three existing timber and brick warehouses. Um, and it was a long time, uh, I think it's Ashlar uh, developer, I'm actually not sure who the developer is, um, but Sweeney and Co are the architects. Um, and uh, what's remarkable about it is that someone through negotiation, through understanding the neighborhood, made an enormous investment in a, in a brand new office building, at really top of its class, um, and retained the inexpensive timber and brick infrastructure that is the innovation space that that entire neighborhood relies on and has relied upon. And so um, they represent that it's possible and it's possible to attract and they've got um, a really great tenants who are moving in uh, in, in a few short months um, and that they've been able to secure. So I would say, is it possible to imagine a city where we go way beyond uh, the historical board, way beyond character districts and say, if you're working in the downtown, you may not tear down that building. You may not. And, um, and it would, that doesn't mean you can't get the density you're looking for, but you can't tear it down. 
Um, and uh, this project represents what might happen. And to tell you what happened in this, ca in this case, and you, you can look it up, you can see it on, I, I'm not sure if it's on Google Street View yet, but I think it's Queen, it's called Queen West Center. You can look it up online right now. Um, the result was an, an incredible structural innovation. There's this double X frame that holds up the tower floating above. It's not a tower, it's maybe only uh, 12 stories of building, but holds it up above the brick buildings. And so the result of a very s strict restriction was innovation and neighborhood improvement. So uh, that would be my risk. Don't, you can't tear it down. Uh, <laughs> Anything. <I did>. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh. So innovation, yeah. I think it's going forward, if there was something I was gonna change, it would be doing it differently. Um, I, every day when I go into City Hall, I remind myself when I'm going through the rotunda, I work for Toronto City Hall. I do not work for Toronto Artscape. I have to remind myself that all the time because I work that closely with Tim Jones and his team. And I think that Tim, Tim is the CEO president, and I think that the, um, the two of us have come to the determination that going forward, we would really like to be working smarter. We've worked hard. And there's only so much working hard you can do. Like you gotta work smarter. And so the section 37, they're, all, they're, they're working hard. And, and you know what, it's great stuff, but there's other sort of mechanisms that if we can, and those mechanisms we haven't figured out yet, because uh, we're making it up as we go along, but for instance, a vendor take back mortgage where Artscape retains a second mortgage for their affordable creative space, both work, live, live, work. Um, those sort of things, once you've figured out the template and the legal mechanism, they uh, work tickety-boo, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the cat and mouse, uh, you know, the negotiating with the developers. It's, it's just a lot of work, and I, I think the developers kind of get it, just like the example you just gave. And so I think everybody wants an artscape. I mean, 10 years ago, it's like, who's artscape, right? Even city council. So I think, I think we're a little bit um, further along, a little, little more sophisticated. So that's what I'd like to see. Um, I just wanted to add, a, add, add to Mona's question, actually. Um, I think that one common thread to, to all of uh, <clears throat> your, your talks today is, uh, is, is analysis and data. and. Um, I think in, in all three cases, there's analysis of uh, you're looking at things that um, are already happening. Um, you know, in, uh, Andre is talking about three billion dollars being maybe spent, and analyz an analyzing five options that have already been established. Um, you know, how could we turn the process around so that we start to basing those options on the analysis, so that we have you know create a, a, a master planning process that becomes reactive or proactive instead of reactive. Um, I, I, I would like to talk about open space in that regard. Um, uh, open space at grade in the city of Toronto right now is in great short, is in short supply. Um, um, one of the things that happened in uh, in the in that first hypergrowth period, 55 to 70, or second hypergrowth period, 55 to 75, that I was talking about, uh, that period of growth proposed that green space was a good thing. Imagine, um, doesn't seem like a bad thing. However, um, the the form that it was given in that first iteration, for whatever reason, and there are many thousands of papers that are out there to to explain what we thought. It didn't work. Um, the city of Toronto's response and planning's response was, well, we need to have buildings that occupy the edges of every site, similar to an urban circumstance. Well, the result of that choice is that every site now is occupied from property line to property line with no, or very, well, actually, I'm gonna say no, no open space, common open space at grade, none. So that means that a, that a building site that would not have been developable before, because there wasn't any open space at grade, now has 45-story tower and a podium that fills from the front property line to the lane in the back. 
When you do that one or two times, you get one circumstance. When you do it across an entire area, you end up with what we have in downtown Toronto, which is no opportunity that anyone can see without a major intervention, no opportunity for new parks. What you get are tiny little pocket parks, parks on the edge of the, of the site. So I would say a forward-looking strategy that is needed, that needs to uh, operate at the scale of thinking of an Olmsted uh, in the city of Toronto, um, or, uh, uh, and I'm trying to remember the name of the great city planner for, for uh, uh, um, uh, Burnham, right? Uh, think about the city of Toronto uh, and its open space in this, at the same scale that developers think about the towers. T developers are always thinking big. You, want, you got 65, I'm going to get 75. You got 85, I'm getting 90. You got 90? hundreds right around the corner, and the, 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 all the policies and all the research that goes on around it, it, it finds a way to support it. Why can't we do the same thing about public space at grade in the city of Toronto? That would be a forward-looking, and I think the analysis is there. We know that there's, it's terribly lacking. There's a, a, a public realm plan that was done for the city of Toronto, um, and it ended up finding, it looked like a, a, like a little quilt, tiny little spaces all over the place, and no big swaths. It's, it's a, we're in desperate need of that in downtown Toronto. It needs a forward vision. Analysis could provide it. And design intelligence that you would all provide um, could uh, see opportunities for it. Okay, yeah. Uh, I would have really two quick ones about getting out ahead of this. I mean, clearly, in terms of the, those avenues, the corridors that I'm talking about, it's the avenue studies. Uh, and the city has actually done some fantastic work. I mean, I'm a real fan of the avenues policy in the City of Toronto official plan. It's a great idea, and what the city planning office was doing is actually doing these avenue studies. But they're actually way behind. They weren't able to get out ahead. That was the problem with West Queen West. I mean, they didn't actually, they hadn't done the avenue study yet, making a detailed built form guidelines and landscape plan for that site. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, in the current debates, I, mean, I, think, I think it's being debated today and tomorrow, they, uh, the, there's been eight planning staff positions at City Hall have been cut from the budget in order to overcome that shortfall of $85 million or whatever they had. I mean, it, with City of Toronto has so much building happening now, not having that extra eight planning positions is probably, there's no way they're going to get ahead in actually doing all the avenue studies that need to be done, you know, including, uh, I mean, Michael's absolutely right, the public space plan, the landscape plan needs to be done for all of these corridors to, to design that intensification process. I guess the other quick one, though, and I mean, I'm a huge fan of Artscape. I think Artscape just, I mean, Tim Jones is the creative city guy in the world. I mean, he is not Richard Florida. It's actually Jones who actually uh, led Artscape and, and created that sort of city building thing that it is. But what's its key thing is uh, not uh, non-profit uh, ownership of real estate in the city. I think is absolutely essential for the creative city as well. I mean, if it's all biddable and you never know where the rent levels are going to be, it's very difficult for arts and all of the, the creative industries to flourish. I'm on the board of the Center for Social Innovation and we've just bought a couple of buildings in downtown Toronto and the reason is when we're renting space, you just never know whether the business model will actually work out in five years because the landlord changes your rent level. So it, actually ownership by non-profits or, or just non-market actors of chunks of the, the downtown is actually essential. Okay, so I would suggest, picking up on the public realm, um, that there is so much work that's been done, the quilt, the uh, patchwork, that you talked about. There's so much work that's been done that actually has been sort of kept quietly on the bookshelf. I'm thinking about ERA Architects uh, Cultural Corridor Study for the Toronto's Waterfront. There's all this great information uh, that needs to bust out and be part of Again, the TO core planning the downtown, not just on the downtown, because we have to do it in Western Mount Dennis, we have to do it in Rexdale, there's all kinds of other places. But we need to use that information and be um, proactive 
as opposed to planning, which is very reactive. And so what, what, it, what needs to happen is everybody breaks down the silos, okay? And that's both within City Hall and not-for-profits and the, the private developers. And I mean, the, the Center for Social Innovation is a really good example of, you know, what uh, even 10 years ago, people didn't really know that was like didn't exist. It didn't <laughs> exist. It was like totally fascinating. Now it's in Center for Social Innovation is in New York City and it's for profit and and it's like so. I mean, it's a really different world that's changing so very quickly. And so again, I think if that we can put it into planning speak, um, then then we're going to be ahead of the curve. I already smell the pizza, but we would really like to <clears throat> uh, we would really like to open up the questions to the students. Uh, can you speak without mic, or shall I? Cut? Yeah, if you stand up, maybe. things that have been talked about is that um, creative industries and artists like to occupy kind of old buildings and I'm wondering what quality about these old buildings is it that we can kind of take to a new building and populate space for all these artists and other creative industries um, kind of like the carpet factory that's in Liberty Village there to take what's great about that building and take the DNA of that and turn that into a new building essentially for a studio project So there are two slides I didn't have in my show. Uh, our office uh, was in a is in a, uh, a knitting mill, uh, an 1880s knitting mill, for about uh, 15 years in Berkeley Castle. What was it? It was um, it was inexpensive um, space um, that was easy to reconfigure. Um, it, um, uh, it it was a lot of area for a little money. We had about. Uh, seven or eight thousand square feet um, it wasn't all glass and so that you could put walls wherever you wanted them on the edge and you had walls that you could pin stuff on um, it was pretty good floor to floor in our case we had about five meters floor to floor um, doesn't have to be quite that high um, uh, and um, it's got to be in a good neighborhood uh, you want to be able to walk uh, around uh, you want to be able to invite people your clients uh, you want to, and you want it to not be precious. You want to be able to, um, and I won't tell you how many times uh, one of your professors was spray painting drawings in the stair, in the fire exit stairs, with with huge signs all over saying no spray painting in the fire exit stairs, and um, because we had a we had a deadline the next day and we were spray painting together actually, um, uh, so it's got to be a space that's okay being messy. Um, and, uh, and 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 is, is really not precious. It's got to be robust. Uh, we moved from there in 2003 to um, another factory building. This one was a 1930s factory building. So this one, the first one was timber and 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 brick. This one's con all concrete. Um, again, it's got about 12, 13 foot floor to floor. So three and a half, almost four meter floor to floor. Um, pretty wide spans, 10 meter, nine and a half meter spans. Um, and just a really big, simple floor plate and a great neighborhood. Uh, so it was that sweet spot of um, uh, uh, being accessible by transit, uh, being walkable, um, and, uh, and having really simple, big spaces. So loft space. Um, you can do that in a new building. You can do it easily in a new building. Um, and you have to become very clever about how to make things, how to make structures and cladding uh, inexpensive. Uh, the Algonquin College project that I showed you, um, uh, which was that uh, the one with the, the pods and, and, the, and the sitting areas, that building, um, I'm not sure I'll ever do it again, but that building was made incredibly inexpensive by being a steel structure, not a concrete structure. And secondly, it was wrapped in freezer panel. Imagine that. An, a modern institution, a high quality institution wrapped in freezer panel. Why would you do that? And the reason you would do it is because they wanted Huge volumes, long spans, simple spaces, unfussy stuff that could be kind of wrecked and repainted, and it would be okay. 
And most of that space that we did for Algonquin College was previously in the back lot of the college. It was hidden and it was just scrappy um, uh, industrial space. Well, they said, we want it built the same way, but we want it to be a prominent institution on the front door of the campus now. So no easy challenge there. Um, same thing, we found, we found a, 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 constru a construction technique, an exterior cladding strategy, and, and we went places we didn't expect to go in order to create this um, inexpensive, big volume, unfussy space. And so you, 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 building cheap space for artists is not easy in 2015. It is not easy. So you gotta think about how to construct it so that it doesn't price, you don't price yourself out of the market and they won't go there. If, if, the, if the threshold of price isn't something where you go, wow, that's really cheap, um, they're gonna go to Weston or to Markham or to Scarborough. Uh, they won't stay in the city. So it's gotta be attractive. Now there are ways, and we've heard of ways that it can be supported, um, uh, but, uh, but as architects, the way that we can encourage it is by knowing how to build better than anyone else. So we, one of the big wins in the West Queen West uh, settlement was 60 affordable live work studios that Artscape um, owned. And uh, it was the first time that Artscape not just got the keys to a city building, but they actually were an owner, which meant they were a developer. Um, because it was Section 37, um, the city was helpful in that we guaranteed the loan, the mortgage, because they actually got the Section 30, 37 and then there was a mortgage on top of that because it was complicated. We had to be a party to that uh, with the lending facility. Um, but with regards to other than affordable with new space, it also, and the floor to ceiling height, it's uh, natural ventilation, it's natural light, it's um, adequate elevators so that it works for creative industries and artists. And it's actually writing that down on a, on a piece of paper, on a spec, and, and, and the back and forth discussing with the um, developers, with the architects. And so just that sort of laundry list of things that really need to be um, thought through is helpful for new space. Um, maybe another ingredient, ingredient that I'd like to mention is because of our you know, work and involvement in Liberty Village, something the clients have mentioned there too is on their, on their list is light from three sides. Um, that in the carpet factory, that's what they, you know, the, the, the units that are c capture the best, highest rents have light from three sides. Um, and another consideration I think is a, a second, uh, <coughs> a, a secondary and tertiary street system. Um, that is, this, if, you, if you take a close look at Liberty Village, you'll find not only a series of streets, like you will anywhere in the city, but little laneways, some of them public, some of them semi-private, uh, between buildings where, um, if, you know, it, uh, just off of Mowat, the little laneways where there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, a shop where they fix bicycles, repair cars, artists in those, in those and they're all, they all live in those little back laneways. So there's a, um, it's a, a more complex fabric than is, is, is perhaps commonly available in the city that's an important component. So I, in answering your question, what, how do we design for this? I think you really have to consider those secondary and tertiary circulation systems and street systems. Just to follow up on that, Rolf, that's a really great point. Uh, artists, creatives, I innovators will all uh, be willing to take a space that you wouldn't think they'd be willing to take because it's in the right neighborhood and it's, and it's got the right size and it's got good light. Um, it wouldn't be a great residence, it might, wouldn't be great retail, it might not be great anything else other than a fabrication and, and, uh, and art space. Uh, there's this great spaces that we only discovered after being in Berkeley Castle for many years, these spaces that were impossible to get to at the back, one single window, but that was perfect for this particular innovator artist because it meant that they had a hundred, you know, 98% wall <laughs> that they could uh, put their stuff on. So um, uh, recognize that, that those, those spaces, those alleyways, those, those lanes that Rolf's talking about, um, are, are best for, for, for some of those kind of people. I can't resist chiming in. Um, Michael, you, you spoke about uh, the time when, when you and I were always spray painting in the, in, the, in the fire stair. And it strikes me that that, that might be part of the answer as, as, as well. 
the slack space, <laughs> the, the, the sense that there's a porch or an alley or, or a, a, a loose overlapping space which is not necessarily absolutely in the public view where every action is supervised but where you can spread out and try things on is no small ingredient to my mind. There's, there are a number of different ways to find that but if, if we thought of somehow the psychology of a porch or, or a veranda or, or perhaps a back stoop as well, and translated that in, into the kind of intermediate grain at the city scale, mm. perhaps we, we, we would be going, going somewhere strong. That doesn't necessarily mean to me a whole labyrinthine network of paths, because that, that could make something insecure as well. But certainly the overlapping space where it's possible to leave your junk, the kind of urban equivalent of, of, of winter porches, strikes me as a really important ingredient.